Hi, I'm Joey Gatto, a fourth semester computer science student at CCM. Uh, this past summer, I was fortunate enough to be uh, accepted into the National Science Foundation's research experience for undergraduates in data science for advancing human services. That's the whole title of it. That's quite the mouthful. I think they should shorten it. But um, it was a really great program, and uh, I kind of want to discuss how the program really it changed my life, influenced what I wanted to do, and I took a lot of uh, really great stuff away from it. So uh, first about the program, why would you want to participate in this undergraduate research program? You can become rich beyond your wildest dreams. Uh, you get $5,000 over the summer, uh, plus $140 a week for food and free housing. So it's $5,000 with no expenses. I mean, the money's enough of a reason alone, right? Uh, meet the love of your life. The program is five guys, five girls. Two people fell madly in love in this program, still dating today. Leave the program less dumb than you were before. That's a personal guarantee of mine. There's a boot camp in the first few weeks. Uh, you learn Python. You learn a program called Rapid Miner, which is basically like statistical analysis for non-programmers. It's like a drag and drop kind of thing. But it's cool. You learn about statistics. Uh, spice up your boring resume. Uh, what looks better than National Science Foundation uh, funded undergraduate research? Uh, nothing. And potentially figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life. I had been thinking about uh, doing research and doing a PhD after my undergraduate years, but um, from what I'd read online, it's, it's a big commitment. It takes five to six years to complete a PhD, and doing research is nothing like doing college coursework, so it really gives you some exposure to what that's like. Um, and guess what? You don't need to be a data science expert to do this. I would say 80% of the kids in this program had never touched data science, they'd never touched Python. Uh, you don't even know, need to know what data science is. There's no expectation for you. You can really go in just uh, with an open mind and a willingness to learn, and you'll take a lot out of it. You don't have to worry about not fitting in uh, for that exact reason. There's no base skill level you need to have. And you don't need to worry about eating garbage college food for 10 weeks. Uh, you can pool that $140 a week together with all of your other uh, roommates, get groceries. So this is some of my uh, inventions during the program. I made this thing called the tower. The bottom layer is a hash brown crust with chicken, ravioli, pasta sauce. Really innovative stuff happened outside of the field of computer science. This was my research team. This was my professor, uh, Professor Usman Rashan. He had three research projects over the summer. Uh, so I worked alone with him and his grad student. The other two had projects. And we'd go out for drinks. It was really a fun thing. It wasn't just like a bunch of nerds in a lab all day. Uh, one day, we, we all, uh, the weekends, you're free to do whatever you want at the program. So one weekend, we actually went down to the shore. I found a $250 arcade game card on the ground. And uh, I went home with a golden fidget spinner, which was cool. And uh, we threw a surprise party for my roommate. I just like this picture. Uh, everyone was really close. It was a really uh, great program. Yes, Mark? Is that your hand? That's uh, not my hand. No, I do not paint my nails pink. But uh, that is the fidget spinner I won. Uh, but Joey, did you learn anything that looks like all fun and games? Great question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, so let's move in some more talking about AI. Um, one more quick thing about the research. Uh, when uh, Professor Bernowski is notified about next summer's program, look for the flyers. I'm sure she'll blast it to all your guys' emails. And uh, it's really a, a great thing to do for your college application and great experience. So the research project I worked on was called Random Hyperplanes versus Deep Learning. And uh, before we get into the research I did specifically, I'd like to discuss just a little bit generally about how artificial neural networks function and about the field of computer vision. So first, let's just talk about how does a computer learn? A computer learns generally the same way that a human learns. Um, so if you give a computer past experiences, it's able to make predictions about the future based off those past experiences. This is basically just like human, one of the ways humans learn. This is called a supervised learning task in AI. That's when you have a series of inputs that are mapped to a known output, and you can train your computer model or your uh, algorithm to recognize certain inputs and what outputs they generally produce. An unsupervised learning task is when you don't have a known output. You're just given data, you don't know what the data is, but you're looking for patterns within the data that allow you to make uh, important inferences. And learning from reinforcement, uh, a reinforcement learning task is more of the uh, traditional kind of, uh, I guess you could think of a robot. And um, it's kind of a point system, so if you're trying to train a robot to walk around a room, you might give it one point for not walking into a wall, but negative three points for hitting the wall. And its algorithm's uh, purpose is to get the highest score possible. So that's kind of how a reinforcement learning task would be. So uh, I want to ask, raise your hand, what, is, what does big data mean to you? What is big data? Anybody? Don't overthink it. Big data is quite literally, 
this no, large set of data. Yeah, large sets of data. And I mean, the implication is that we, we haven't had access to these large data sets before. Uh, what about data science? What do you think, how would you define the field of data science? The organizing and interpretation of big data. Yeah, it's really uh, any science that is data dependent. So AI, machine learning, uh, data analysis, all of these things fall under the, the very large umbrella that is data science. And why is data science becoming so popular? That's because businesses are starting to realize that you can make a lot of money off of finding insights from uh, data that your company is generating. And this is data we've never really had before. So this is Kaggle.com. And I just want to give you an example of how much money companies are investing into data science. So right now, there's a $1.2 million prize for whoever can improve Zillow.com's uh, house price, housing price prediction algorithm. So um, Zillow is an online um, a real estate marketplace. So right now, uh, the leader is able to predict the correct uh, price that a house will sell for with only 0.06% error. And uh, this team here is going to win a million dollars if that holds. Uh, and these, uh, and by the way, if you win a Kaggle competition, like, you're getting a job. Like that's, uh, to say in a really millennial way, that's the ultimate machine learning clout that you can have. Uh, there are lots of uh, machine learning competition sites, but Kaggle is like number one. Jeremy, what's the 499 mean? A uh, number of entries that they've submitted. So you can, uh, I imagine, I'm, I'm currently in a machine learning competition where you can only submit once a day. I imagine on Kaggle you can just kind of submit it. I'm actually going to talk about how these machine learning competitions work. So let's say this is our housing data. We might have the crime rate, uh, the number of rooms in the house, how old the house is, some kind of tax rate. And then our target variable here at the end is the price of the house. Now what they do is Zillow provides you with this housing data. And you're going to want to split your data into a training set and a test set. The point of the training set is to train your algorithm to recognize what kind of inputs lead to what kind of prices. And then to make sure your algorithm isn't just memorizing that information, you use your test set to show it uh, new information it's never seen and see how well it makes predictions. If it does well, you submit your model to Kaggle. Kaggle shows it even more new data. And if it's generalizing well, meaning it's not memorizing the, the data they gave you, then you can win a million dollars. Um, so how might we make this prediction? The simplest case would be to take one variable, so we'll say the number of rooms, and plot all the points on a graph. So you know, two and a half rooms, there might be one house that's you know, $2 million or $3 million, whatever it may be. And this is called linear regression. So the linear regression line is drawn to minimize the distance between all of these data points and the line. So it's the line that best fits the data, if you will. So as you can see, there seems to be a positive uh, linear relationship between the number of rooms and the price of a house. So we could uh, have a new house we don't have the price for, go along to uh, how many rooms it has on the x-axis, go up to that point in the red line. And you know, if we have enough rooms, we seem to have a decent approximation for what that house might be. So this is uh, one example of how uh, machine learning works, is drawing this best fit line. Yes? So its guess is a point on the line of best fit that it creates. For yes, the yes. Um, now if you add more features, this is what it might look like. You would just have a hyperplane where you have feature one, feature two, and then the prediction would be on the z-axis. And you can do this for any number of features. We just can't really visualize it past being in 3D. But you could have an infinite amount of features and use them to make predictions this way. And this would be called a, a linear model. But now let's say we're proposed with a new task. We're given image data about cats, and we want to know, is this a cat or is this not a cat? Much more difficult task with image data. Now, ideally, our data is linearly separable. Uh, this is a good time to explain my t-shirt. One of the ways of uh, classifying things is with an algorithm called a support vector machine. Uh, there's a, something called the linear support vector machine, which is essentially the, the line I just showed you. But in case you're wondering, it looks just like this picture. Anyway, ideally, if our data is linearly separable, if uh, not a cat is green and cat is blue, we plot all of our data points, and once we get new image data, whichever side of the line the image falls on, we can classify it as cat or non-cat. 
This would be very accurate considering we're able to draw a line that completely separates our images. But this is a highly unrealistic expectation when trying to classify something as cat or non-cat. What's more likely to happen is you're going to need a more complex function, something that might be a circle. And even still, a perfect circle is probably unrealistic. It's, it's going to be a, a crazy line you know, that can really determine uh, the cats from the non-cats. And this is where the artificial neural network comes into play. It's able to uh, model very complex functions. So the artificial neural network you may have heard the term deep learning. That's really the uh, big buzzword in AI. All deep learning means is an artificial neural network um, with uh, many layers in the middle. If there was only one layer here, it wouldn't be deep learning. This is an example of a deep learning model. Uh, they were theorized in the 60s. Um, they are not new. What's new is the fact that we have enough data and enough computational resources to train them to be effective. The uh, mathematical process behind the neural network, is it's a, universal, it's a universal function approximator. Theoretically, it can really model any set of inputs to a series of outputs, which is really uh, why it's such a hot topic in AI. Obviously, this isn't uh, the case 100% of the time. It's also not the uh, best choice, because they take a long time to train. And if you're only, for example, you know, getting a slight increase in accuracy, it might not be worth the computational expense that they cost. Um, but we're going to go into depth now um, about how the neural network works. Please stop me at any point if you have any questions. Um, the main components of an artificial neural network are the neurons, the weights, the layers, and the bias. So we're going to spend some time on this next slide. Um, <clears throat> so we're classifying something here. Here we have our input layer. The input layer is going to be uh, uh, a list of features. So all the circles here are neurons. You can think of a neuron as one of the features that described uh, the price of a house. So this could be the uh, number of rooms a certain house has. This could be, you know, the crime rate. Or if we're talking about cat versus non-cat, you know, this could be a pixel or this could be fluffiness, cuteness, you know, whatever it is. The input layer contains the features about what we're trying to classify. Now, as you can see, each feature here in the input layer has a weight connecting it to something in the hidden layer. These weights are randomly initialized, and they will be learned over time to approximate the input to the output that we desire. Um, so if we look at the hidden layer here, we look at H1, you can see that there's a weight connecting it to each feature in the layer before it. Now, if we, what happens is the weights get multiplied by the inputs, and they're all added together here into this hidden neuron. So now we have this aggregate of weight of, mu of the multiplication of weights and inputs that are stored into H1. And this will happen for every neuron in the hidden layer. Are you with me? Yes? Yes, question? So, so you, the number of inputs is always multiplied to every single um, neuron in the hidden Generally. This is called a fully connected neural network, where what you're saying would be true. I'm sure there are cases when people don't do that, but yes, for now. Yes? So did you say that if so for the weights, is it based off of previous information, or does it just keep on guessing? They are, they are, I will explain to you how they update, but they are uh, randomly initialized to begin with. So it just keeps on guessing until it finally finds a balance? Not quite, but when I get to the uh, part about how this learns, then I if that doesn't answer your question, ask me again. Um, so for you uh, computer scientists in here, you might ask, how does this really work in the computer? It's really uh, you know, an n-dimensional matrix being multiplied by a matrix of weights, and then those values are stored here. That's, that's how it actually looks. But for now, it's easier to visualize this way. So now we have these values that are in hidden, unit, hidden layer 1. This part seems to be a part people uh, aren't comfortable with at first. We have to put uh, this aggregate of inputs and weights into something called an activation function. And what the activation function does primarily is it provides a nonlinearity to the network that allows us to model complex functions. If we were just multiplying inputs by weights, inputs by weights, it would, it would just be like y equals mx plus b. It'd be just a linear model. Putting an activation function into these hidden layers is what gives us uh, the ability to model complex functions. So we multiply the inputs by the weights. We put it into an activation function. So now, this hidden layer over time is going to represent new features that the model is learning. Here are known features. Here are features the model is creating. And once we have the output from the activation function, we multiply that output by the weight, and we go to our output layer. So the output layer could have any number of neurons. 
um, if, for example, we're classifying cat versus no cat, we would just have one neuron in the output layer and it would give you a probability from zero to one. If the task was, is this a cat, a dog, or a fish, it would give you the probability it thinks it is of each one. So if you have a, a well-trained network and you put a cat into it, it might say 95% sure it's a cat, 2% sure it's a fish, 3% sure it's a dog. And in the case of the housing price, you would just have one neuron in the end and it would give you, you know, your, your predicted housing price. So the next logical question is, how is this thing learning? Uh, this is the most difficult concept to understand, and this is why I substituted a CS elective for Calc 3. This is the process called gradient descent or backpropagation. Um, what happens is there is a function that measures how well the network is performing. So once you get your output, remember, we know what the true output is when we're training the network. We see how well the prediction compares to the true value. And that, value, that performance measure is, is measured by something called a loss function. What you do is you take the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to the weights. And that gives you the direction in which you're supposed to update the weights. This is a, this is a complicated thing to understand, but have, have, has everyone here taken Calc 1? Yes? OK, so bear with me. Here we have our, our graph, and I know it's hard to see. But if we have a parabola, right, and this is our loss function, and let's say our loss is right here, it's kind of high. If we take the derivative, it's going to point us towards the minimum loss that would minimize our error. Now, there's another parameter in the neural network called the learning rate, and that's what determines how far you jump in this direction. So if it's too big, your derivative might send you here and then send you back up here, and you'll jump out. If it's too small, it'll, it'll, it'll go on forever, essentially. But that's what's happening. You're calculating uh, partial derivatives in high dimensional spaces between that loss function and all of these weights. And the value you get after finding the direction and how big of a step you want to take towards the minimum is what the weight is updated by. And as you keep putting in images and images into the neural network, um, it learns what weights to put here, what we, or what the values of the weights should be. And after enough iterations and enough uh, examples that it sees, it can approximate uh, functions really, really well. And, and that's how the neural network works. The only thing we haven't discussed is the bias. All you really need to know about the bias is it, it, makes, sure, excuse me, it makes sure that things don't go to zero and, and everything kind of gets started. It's not an essential learning process. Yes? Um, so you mentioned the activation function mm -hmm. uh, in the hidden layer. Is that something that's specific to each case of uh, what you're using the neural network? Um, the next slide is on activation functions, because that's the question I always get. Are there any questions, though, about how the neural network Learns things? No? Yes? Yeah. How many inverts do you have? Because I feel like with something that's anomalous, or like any type of anomaly, you have to try to account for everything within the inputs. Um, well, maybe this. So let's say we are looking at image data, and we have a 28 by 28 image. You would, in this case, uh, flatten the image. So 28 by 28, I think, is 784. And you would have each pixel going into the network. And uh, that's kind of how the inputs would look f for image data. Um, does that answer your question? Are you asking how it does it predicts things that are? Yeah, like how, how does it do with anomalies in terms of like like how? Like if we have like really bad outliers in our data? Yeah. Okay. Like Good question. Um, uh, applied feature, uh, excuse me. Applied machine learning is uh, most of it is is feature engineering, which is you, you're picking high quality features before you put it into the network. Um, you don't just throw things in there and hope everything comes out well. You spend a lot of time picking what features within your data set are good predictors of the output. This might be a really stupid question, but how do you persist this network? You save it in the database? Like, how do you <coughs> save your work, essentially? Uh, modern machine learning frameworks, they kind of have a built-in function that allows you to save your model. Okay. Um, so that's usually how you would do it. Um, yes? So you start off with, uh, like, with a weight, or do you give it a weight initially? Yeah, you randomly initialize weight. Yeah. And then the machine basically keeps on iterating, and then it fixes its weight based on the learning is done through the weights. Okay. Yes. How does it handle like if, for example, the house the house example mm -hmm. house price? Let's say for one house, there's no record of uh, crime rate. How would it account? How does it account for missing data? Yeah. That would come in the feature engineering process. So 
you would um, either input maybe the mean value from the column or the mean value of that neighborhood uh, if it was missing or get rid of that column. But no, it would not work if you just had missing. It would, you, an error would be thrown. But it's something you would account for before running this model. Yes? For the dog catfish example, yes. what would it throw out if it had a picture of both two animals, like a dog and a cat in it? Would it say... I, I, that would be very uh, specific to the situation. I mean, ideally, it would it'd be 50-50, right? Um, but I, I don't know. Okay. We're going to talk more about activation functions a little bit. Um, so as I said before, it adds nonlinearity to the network. It allows you to uh, model more complex functions. It, act, it also, when you're calculating the derivatives to update the weights, it, it makes the uh, gradient calculations faster. There's another benefit to the activation function. What determines the activation function, which was essentially your question, um, most act, there's a standard activation function used in the hidden layers called the ReLU activation function. Um, there's a lot of different activation functions that can serve the same purpose. Usually people pick a function that's going to converge faster. And then the, uh, the output activation function is the one that's different. And that'll be if you're trying to squeeze it between 0 and 1, or all three different outputs between 0 and 1. Or if it's a regression problem and you're predicting a price, it'd be a different. It's basically how you want your output to be formatted. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk about some fields within artificial intelligence. I think people think AI is just, you know, uh, robots that are going to take over the world. There's that viral video of that robot doing a backflip that's going around now. I mean, that's not the only field within AI. Um, so artificial general intelligence is the study of, um, you know, making, building computers that can think like humans. Now, uh, as you probably know, because you haven't heard about that, uh, it's not much has come from that field. Um, there's obviously a lot of research going on, but I think it was uh, Yan LeCun, who's the AI, uh, AI research director at Facebook, said we're 20 or 50 years away from having an AI as smart as a mouse. So this whole Elon Musk, we're going to be taken over by robots thing has been widely disputed by the AI community. Uh, machine learning. I put machine learning with a star next to it because I think of machine learning more as being used for tasks like predicting housing prices and more numeric tasks, not necessarily predicting or not necessarily emulating like human characteristics, but more like uh, number crunching and finding uh, patterns within data that humans couldn't find. But the, the three main things within AI are natural language processing, which is kind of sifting through text documents. So when you go on Google and you look at your news tab, uh, the way they aggregate all those articles together by you know uh, what common articles are related to your search is through something called natu natural language processing. Speak right Speech recognition is, uh, you know, the science behind Siri, Alexa, and uh, computer vision, which is, you know, how Im uh, computers can look at images and make decisions from those images. And that's what uh, the research I did over the summer, and we're going to talk um, for the rest of the time about computer vision. So here's a picture of a really adorable cat. And before we talk about computer vision, we need to all be on the same page about the fact that the way a computer looks at an image is it looks at it as a three-channel RGB image where at each, each pixel, we can see how red that pixel is, how green it is, and how blue it is. So these are pixel intensity numbers. And when you put them on top of each other, you can make any image. So this could very well represent this cat. It doesn't. I just picked the cute cat because I like cats. But that's, that's how it's looking at matrices of numbers. And that's how it's uh, classifying images. So now that we understand that, I think this is an interesting image because I think this would be really hard for a computer to classify. Um, you can see, first of all, it's easy for computers to look at an image and go, oh, there's a curvy line here, there's a blue line here, there's a circle here. But high-level abstractions like man, woman, sitting, business, laptop, pointing, so, so difficult for a computer to do. So, for example, this table's white, blends in with her shirt and the laptop. I think it'd be hard-pressed to find that it's sitting, the, the model. There's no branding on this laptop. Uh, the watermark here might mess it up. She has very short hair, and if it was only trained on images of women with long hair, it might not be able to uh, recognize her. Um, there's a lot of things going on here that could throw off an image classification model. I think a more practical uh, use of computer vision that you might think of is self-driving cars. So think of how difficult the challenge is that live, while you're driving, it has to know where the lane is, where the car is, how far away the car is, you know, what the side of the road is, what a person looks like, how far to stay away from those things, what the speed limit is. Is that a red light, you know, yellow light, green light? 
all these things. There's so much that has to happen, and the computer isn't just displaying these images. It's understanding them and making decisions from them. We don't really think about, you know, I explained this to my little brother. He's like, oh, what is your research about? I was like, oh, it's helping computers understand images. And he goes, why don't you just scan it? And I was like, you know, it's funny. We don't think about when it's just displaying pixels on our screen that it has no idea what it's displaying. Um, so what's wrong with computer vision technology? Well, in one sense, nothing. It's actually really advanced and performing really well. But the, there are some downsides. It's very computationally expensive. Uh, it's also very difficult to implement. From, from my personal research, the, uh, the networks that you need to use for computer vision are, are very difficult. And um, the algorithms are very hard for humans to interpret. You could look at the linear regression example from earlier and know exactly uh, what predicts housing prices, you know, lots of rooms, high price. When you look at a model that's predicting uh, images, you're not really sure what features um, are helping predict that image. So the industry standard way of classifying an image is something called a convolutional neural network. This is probably the most difficult concept to understand in computer vision, but I figured before I explain uh, the research that I did in computer vision, you should know what they use in industry today. So if, if you were to have, these are your RGB three channel matrices that represent your image. What the convolutional neural network does is it creates these filters and it scans across your matrix and it looks for patterns. So for example, if you had a filter that looked like this, it's going to look for a straight line at the top of the filter, and it's going to save all the straight lines into something called a feature map. So this is an unfortunately blurry image, but I thought it did the best job depicting what I'm talking about. So as you have these filters that scan through your image, it saves the most important features within the image into something called feature maps that they then use to classify the image. So another way to think about this is, if you look at, if you're trying to classify this woman's face, think about it. The color of her skin, her hair, and her shirt are really not helpful in classifying her. So many people have those same exact traits. What's unique about her is the shape of her eyes, the shape of her eyebrows, the shape of her nose, mouth, head. That's what's going to help classify her. And that's what's happening. It's extracting the most important features from within the image. This is another way you can think about it. Um, as it goes through the network, it gets more high and high level abstractions here. You might see this easier on your computer screens, but as we get deeper and deeper, you go from just edges to actual you know, objects within the image. Uh, so this is a picture of my computer burning from running a convolutional neural network. And that's just a little joke to take away from all the math that we've been talking about here. Uh, but uh, in all seriousness, you could probably run a convolutional neural network on your computer uh, with a relatively uh, small data set, like maybe 40, 50,000 images. But when you get up past that and you start having you know, hundreds of thousands and then you have millions of parameters for your network, it, your program is going to crash and you're really not able to experiment with this stuff. So my study, the goal of random hyperplanes versus deep learning, um, really we are discovering an alternative image classification model. Um, the method that we use is nothing like what I just described to you. Uh, exp we're also exploring the effectiveness of various image classification models. And this isn't really a goal. This is just something I thought was cool, is that this is something that's much faster and easier to run on your computer. So um, I like to think it'd be, uh, make the technology more accessible to others. So this is, this is tough to explain, because um, you're, you're not going to understand why it works, because we don't understand why it works. This is an idea my professor and his grad student had. Uh, the element of randomness is a huge component of this algorithm. Uh, but I'm just going to read this, and then I'm going to show you with pictures how it works. So first, we randomly generate hundreds of thousands of hyperplanes, um, which if we think about it in 2D, it would just be lots of lines that are getting drawn to separate our data. After each hyperplane is created, we evaluate the performance of how well it separated the images, and we save those predictions. Once the predictions are made from each, for, uh, excuse me, once the predictions are made for each line, for each classifier, we use these features in a traditional machine learning model, and these turn out to be more high-quality features. So before we were extracting high-quality features, here we're kind of generating high-quality features through the art of randomness. So let's say we have this image here and we draw this line and we say, okay, everything to the left of the line is a one 
everything to the right of the line is a zero. So if blue is one class and red is another, as you can see, we've misclassified a couple of these here. We have a couple reds that are on this side of the line, a couple blues that are on this side of the line. But overall, it does a pretty good job at separating our images. Let's draw another completely random line. And we say everything to the left of this is a one, everything to the right of this is a zero. Now, this is horrible. This is a horribly drawn line separating our images. But if you imagine, we're building a spreadsheet where if we come back here, we have all of our data points. We say, OK, this ended up being a 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. Then we draw another line. This thinks it's a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay. We draw another line. This one's not too bad. So we say everything to the left is classified as a 1. Everything to the right is a 0. So we're just building up, we're building up a spreadsheet of these random predictions where the images on, the, on the, the left side here are the same. You know, If we're looking at this one, this could be represented. D does that part of it make sense? That we're classifying the same image every time by different lines. When we, found, we found that when we do this hundreds of thousands of times, and we throw these, model, these features into like a linear regression model, it actually can classify the images really well. There's no mathematical theory behind it. And it's, it's crazy uh, that it works. It was an idea they had. And this is called feature engineering. It's a fe yes? So do you use all of the planes that you create, uh, created, or is it just the best ones? All of them. All of them. Yeah. Wow. So it compares the results off of each other, and then it basically makes a better line based on all the results. You, no, you're just generating. OK, so do you remember how when we did the linear regression, we picked a feature, and we plotted the data points, and we drew a line that separated them, right? Uh, what's happening is we're saying that everything on one side of the line is going to be We're plotting the same data points every time. We're just classifying them differently. And over time, as we add more and more hyperplanes, um, you can almost think of it like as it's, it's averaging everything together. Um, if there's no one best fit line, if we just average the results of 200,000 lines, we get a pretty good score. That's, that's maybe an easier way to think about it. Is there a level now? Like, would, did, like you hit enough hyperplanes that you kind of weren't getting much? That's a good question. I, I think from, and I, I, I didn't work on the development of this algorithm directly. I'll explain what my role in the study was. Um, I understand how it works. Um, as far as a ton of specific benchmarks, I don't know. I, I think generally, though, the more, the better they've had. Um, so if you didn't understand that, don't worry. Clearly, the people working on it don't either. Um, but it's interesting, because one thing you learn about, you know, you think you're going to go into a, doing a PhD, and you're going to develop this ground-shattering research. But that's not it. You're, you're progressing your field, even just by this much. So we've come up with a method that utilizes randomness to classify images in a way that no one's done before, someone else might read the study and go, oh, wow, this gives me an idea to do this or that. So I think it's a, a pretty unique idea they had that turned out to be uh, pretty successful. And we're going to see some of the results we've had here. So um, in a, we'll see the results in a second. But my role in the study, this, this was a really great experience for me. Because uh, the professor and the grad student, they spent the time developing the new algorithm. And for me, what they needed was, they needed benchmark results on the data sets we were using for all the other popular feature engineering methods. So I had to spend the summer learning how all of these other methods worked while they worked on focusing on the algorithm. So work that was tedious to them was very valuable to me. I got to uh, research how all these things work. And any questions that I had, I had two experts who could sit me down and explain it to me. So I mean, it was really, it's not just like you know looking something up on Stack Overflow and you don't understand it. It was like I had two pros who could be like, no, this is why this works like this. And I really got to understand these things inside and out and contribute to the study, even if in a minimal way, uh, in a way that was, was valuable. So I used primarily these three methods, which we're not going to talk about, but it, they're just ways that you extract high quality features from an image. And then I also got benchmarks on the convolutional neural network that we discussed earlier. And so far, the, the results have been pretty good. So this is a very famous data set called MNIST. Uh, it's actually very easy to classify. Um, so we can actually linearly separate this image data with 93% accuracy. But when we start to use feature engineering methods, we get up to 97, 98% accuracy, which is pretty awesome. 
And of course, I hope I never implied that we uh, were out to defeat the convolutional neural network, but having a method like ours that's faster and very different that can even compete with it um, a little bit uh, is valuable. So here the CNN is better, but our feature engineering methods still perform uh, pretty closely. Here's another much more difficult data set to uh, classify. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a good image. It's essentially, it's called Kaifar 10. It's essentially 10 different images of uh, vehicles. And I think there's a horse and, or maybe it's vehicles and animals. Um, not linearly separable at all. Only 65% accuracy. And honestly, part of that's probably the algorithm guessing. I mean, it's, it's a much trickier data set. But with, with the random hyperplanes algorithm, we can get 90 to 92% accuracy when we're using feature engineering. And uh, the best convolutional neural networks can get up to 95, 96%. But we're, we're getting pretty close, which, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's really my study. Um, I spent the summer uh, learning how all of the things work that I needed for the, uh, the benchmarks for the rest of the study. And then my grad student professor worked on the other algorithm. <laughs> Uh, so what did I gain from this program? Definitely uh, a great fundamental knowledge of machine learning and deep learning. Um, I, I worked in TensorFlow a lot, which is Google's AI library for Python. Um, I also used Keras and the uh, library called Scikit-Learn, which isn't a deep learning library, but it's, it's a machine learning library. It basically has everything that's not neural networks, any machine learning model you could think of. Uh, how to read research papers. Every week we had to uh, write up a little like half a page, one page report on a research paper in our field and uh, that was very challenging in the beginning and you really, it's really a skill. You don't have to read you know, the whole thing to get the gist of it. Um, how to work independently. The, the program, it's not like you sit and do class all day. You, know? you might meet with your professor for an hour or two but you really are on your own time doing your own research and you have to learn how to stay motivated and work independently in order to succeed. And um, as I mentioned earlier, it really validated that I want to do a career in research. I, I never did work before where I felt like I was like, possibly like, benefiting uh, you know, the field of computer science or AI. And it was, uh, regardless of what my income would be in the field of research, it, it, it felt good and like something I wanted to contribute to. Um, so the last slide, I just want to talk about what skills I think you need for AI research. But before I talk about what math you need, this should not discourage you from experimenting. This is just at the research level what's important. I mean, the papers I read were like pure math. Like they were so over my head. Um, I came back to CCM. I was like, Professor Bernowski, please let me take Calc 3 instead of a CS elective. Like I need to understand gradient descent. Um, so I also took the honors probability and statistics course here where they teach R, which is great. But Calc 1 through 3, linear algebra, which is you know, matrix multiplication and addition, uh, very important for understanding how the neural network works. And uh, probability and statistics. Remember, everything we're doing, we're outputting a prediction. Uh, probability theory is, uh, is really the, the underlying mathematical process behind all machine learning. I heard so eloquently put one time, actually, that statistics was the god math of machine learning. Uh, programming languages, everything cool for AI is built for Python, so you have to know Python. Good news is, if you know Java, Python is so easy. Everything's generic. You don't need to put semicolons. It's great. You'll learn Python in like a night, you guys. Um, and R is really good for data science and statistical analysis. As I've done the R lab here, I've really seen if you're just analyzing numbers, R is better than Python. But when you're building models to make predictions, I think Python is far superior. Um, machine learning library, so NumPy, Pandas. I, I already talked about Scikit-Learn. NumPy is a matrix algebra library. Everyone, if you guys go home and research this stuff, everyone uses NumPy. Pandas is data frame management. Everyone uses Pandas. Um, and we talked about TensorFlow and that. And then um, for resources, I started out on Coursera doing their machine learning course. They, they lead off with a ton of math. They throw a bunch of form. Ian and I did this. They, they throw a bunch of formulas in your face. There's like a whole week of linear algebra. It was very off-putting. Uh, the courses on Udemy I found are much less math heavy. They cost like 10 bucks, but they give you the intuition. They don't really shove the math down your throat. You do not need to know the math to start learning this stuff. Uh, you just need to know how the models work. You just need to know that it's trying to draw a line that separates the images. You don't need to know how that line is created. Um, but you can definitely do it on your own. And uh, I, think, I think these are the two best resources. And I put blogs up here because anytime you find like an algorithm and you want to know how it works, there's this movement in the machine learning community to write uh, you know, research papers in like readable English. Uh, so there's a lot of resources online like that too where they're written very casually. Um, 
but that's it. So you guys have any questions? Yes. So near the beginning, you were talking about algorithms like negative reinforcement, where it feels like something walking into a wall would give it negative three points, so avoiding the wall, it would get a point. Mm -hmm. And it wants to get a higher score. How does that actually, like, it's out of the answer, how does it actually incentivize it? Isn't it already default not going to want to walk into the wall? Um, before I answer this question, I want to say that reinforcement learning is something I haven't gone into, but I can tell you it's the same concept behind minimizing your loss function that I drew on the board. It's just that the loss function is formatted differently and penalizes certain actions more than others. Okay. Um, but it's, it's that same concept. It's just, it's just where um, certain types of loss make uh, your error greater. It's not like evenly distributed like it would be in a regular neural network. Okay, all right. So um, when using these libraries, like let's say, I actually, on my own machine, I actually have TensorFlow downloaded. I haven't touched it <laughs> because like, I don't really know where to start. Mm -hmm. So um, when using these libraries, like how do you actually, I guess, go about using them? You know what I mean? Like how do you actually get started with, with that? I taught, I taught myself everything through online classes on Udemy and Coursera. Um, I, uh, because while I did have the professor and the grad student to help me, at the same time, you can't go to them with like, you could, but you don't, you don't want to go to them with like baby questions, you yeah, know? Exactly. So I'll, I would spend like all morning, all night doing these classes and only the toughest concepts would I go to them and say, this doesn't really answer your question because you're not in the program now, but, but that's how I went about it. Um, I, I, would, I would go on Udemy and look at, there's a guy named uh, Jose uh, Portilla, I think, who has a TensorFlow course, really good and uh, not math heavy, very concept heavy. And I taught everything to myself through massive online uh, open courses. Similar to that question, is there like a Stack Overflow tech site where you can ask people about these kinds of questions? Definitely, even Stack Overflow. Like when you start looking it up yourself, you'll see it all kind of falls on the same site. And I think Stack Exchange, correct me if I'm wrong, that's for like specific fields, I think. Um, within science and uh, they have like a whole data science stack exchange that's really valuable. And actually, um, on, uh, they have Google groups. For example, Keras, which is a, a library I really like for deep learning. Um, they have a whole Google group dedicated to people who are users of that library and help each other out. So there's a big online community that can help you out with any questions that you might have. Um, were you taking those online courses while you were going to CCM? Or did you like? I took something called, uh, to grasp the concept. Uh, when I got accepted into the program, um, I had about two and a half, three weeks between the semester ending and the program starting, and I like devoted it to uh, this course called, I think it was like Python for Machine Learning and Data Science Bootcamp on Udemy, and um, I just sat and like went through it. It was like <laughs> it was like three or f like like seventy hours of like lectures. And, uh, but it covered, I mean, everything you would need to know um, for the program and where to get started. That's actually the course I'd probably recommend to any beginner. So I'm guessing that like a regular computer isn't strong enough to do what you did over the summer. So were you working with like more advanced machine or? I did have a computer cluster. Okay, so actually m most image uh, recognition stuff is run on GPUs because GPUs do matrix multiplication much faster than CPUs, at least in parallel. So they give us these computer clusters that we can log into um, at school. Uh, I, I also, I mean, you know, the computer blowing up thing is a joke. You might be able to run it on your computer, but it'll be so slow that it would probably discourage you from even wanting to, to do this. Like you'd leave your computer on for a day running it and it'd just be about ready to blow up like heat wise um, so we did have access to computers yes and I actually still have access to them so that uh, Kaggle competition you showed the guys that are crushing what stack are they using uh, they yeah the, the the main thing they do is actually it's called it's actually called stacking um, and essentially the concept is you use like two or three different classifiers that specialize in different things. So maybe you have linear regression is one, neural network is another. You take the predictions from each of them and use those predictions as features. And another classifier is a really popular method um, 
for, for Kaggle. Uh, there's actually an entire course on Coursera called How to Win Machine Learning Competitions, like a Kaggle like all-star or something like that. Um, so there's, there's ways to, and they actually have a, a blog on Kaggle that answers questions just like that, so. What do you think some of the um, best applications for like deep learning and you know, AI and something? In like the real that? world? Or, yeah, are right now or maybe even in the future? Well, for, for stuff like the housing pricing, it's really not used. People don't really use neural networks for regression tasks like that. It's more so what I said, natural language processing. I mean, you think about um, why can't you use Siri when you don't have the internet? That's because it has to go through some neural network to classify what your voice just said. And it's, you know, it's doing it in cloud computing, uh, not on your phone. That's why the iPhone X, it had like, that neural processor it came out with. It can actually run those models on your phone now, which is pretty cool. Um, but that's one application for it. Uh, it's mostly, I would say, it's mostly been used for things that emulate human characteristics. So you have to have features for it to be able to compare. You have to have defined features for it to compare all these data sets with. Right? In a supervised learning task, yes. Right. Unsupervised so, might be um, an example of unsupervised. Actually, um, might be. So this is a, a restricted Boltzmann machine image here, and you might go from all of the uh, the pixels of your input to a, a layer where you might go from 100 to 50 pixels. And if you can reconstruct the image from the 50 pixels, you've kind of compressed your image to be half the size. And uh, you can save a lot of space that way. It's like a, a form of compression it can be used for. So that's an example of using a neural network with no output. You know, There are other functions than just making predictions. So then in a supervised environment, um, is there like a plateau that you hit where it doesn't matter how many more features you put into it where you start to see decay? Definitely. Uh, you know, the, People say all the time, like, oh, your model's not learning well enough, like, get more data. But, you know, if the features are garbage or if it's messy or if there's bias in it or it's inaccurate, you know, no amount of features is, is going to matter. It's, it's very situation dependent. It's hard to make a generalization. But, yeah, you, you have the right idea. So in an unsupervised um, learning situation, after the first run through, um, does it create its own features from the results that it processed? And well, you don't tell it if it's right or wrong. So what I did with the restricted Boltzmann machine was you, you build a model that takes your input. So it takes your input pixels, and it, and it um, then tries to find the most important features in the hidden layer. So you're going from four to three here. Then it reconstructs the original image from the layer with less features. It sees what the error is. And if the error is really low and you're able to reconstruct your image, from less pixels, that means your features are more high quality. So what I was doing was I was reducing uh, the size of my data set by feature engineering and throwing this into a linear regression. And actually, I don't even know if we did the random hyperplanes on, on the MNIST because uh, no one cares about MNIST because it's so easy. Like, you could do 93% with a straight line. But this is what I did for the 97 to 90%, 8% accuracy. I was just getting the features from the, the neural network with no output. So, can you, so do you have to start from like zero every time with the neural, uh, with the machine learning, like, or can you take what an al how an algorithm is done and feed it to? Can you feed an already trained model new information? Well, because like, sure. you had something that was starting out without being mm -hmm. run already and trained. So, that yeah. Good question. So that's why uh, people don't use neural networks all the time. Because some people view them as the silver bullet that can solve any problem. Remember we said it's a universal function approximator? But they take so long to train that if you know, you're loading new data into it all the time that's coming from your website, but it takes six hours to train and you only get a 2% increase from when you use linear regression, like what's the point? You know, it's not always the answer. Great yeah. that you're, uh, they, you know, figure out what a cat is, but the second I want to put a dog in there, it has to relearn the entire thing. Exactly. Um, and the cat example is, you know, just a... Right, no, I get it. But, did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. How many iterations run before you've decided it's got an accurate? Good question. Uh, once again, depends. Um, between hundreds and thousands. Um, but if you iterate too long, it starts to memorize the data. So, um, actually, they, they do this thing called early stopping, where while you're 
simultaneously training your network, you're using part of your test set to see how well you're performing on new data. And if you see that you're starting to memorize the data and that little test set's not doing well, it'll just stop it from training because it sees that it's starting to memorize it. Um, that's important. What? That's that. We usually it remembers that's important. It's called overfitting. And uh, overfitting your training data means it's not going to generalize to new data. So there's a lot of different ways to prevent overfitting. Um, and that's early stopping is one of them. Can you mention some of the other projects that other oh, yeah. of, like yourself worked on this summer? I probably had the most selfish project. Everyone else was out like trying to cure diseases and stuff. Um, so there was one group that uh, was looking at images of skin cancer and seeing how well they could uh, classify cancerous patches of skin versus non-cancerous patches of skin through computer vision. They were using convolutional neural networks. Um, there was one group that was looking at social media data from a uh, uh, cancer forum and finding which regions of the country were more susceptible to certain types of cancer with the end goal of hoping to promote certain kind of, I guess, uh, health practices in those regions to help prevent it. Uh, there was one group that was looking at genomic sequencing data, which is super over my head if you don't know anything about biology. Uh, the one girl who was in that group was actually a bio major, so she was very uh, helpful in contributing there, but they, they worked with genomic sequencing data. And um, has anyone heard of the site 23andMe where you spit in a tube and they give you like part of your uh, genome sequence? They, they actually built, this is actually, a, I don't remember the link. I think it's done. Um, but you can up, they send you that data on a flash drive, and you can upload it to a site that they built, and it'll give you an odds ratio of how likely you are to have like a certain kind of cancer or a certain disease, which is something 23andMe doesn't feel comfortable telling you. But what they've developed gives you an idea if you're interested in, in knowing. I personally would be terrified by looking at that and don't want to know. But pretty cool. Yeah. So where do you plan on going now that you've done all this? I mean, you told us like how to get started and stuff. Where do you go from there? What? Like, do, you, do, you do you ask what my personal yeah. study looks like now? Yeah. Um, well, I'm trying to get data science internships, which if you're looking for, you have to apply like now. Uh, and one thing that I don't have under my belt is like data wrangling uh, knowledge, like uh, SQL and Hadoop and Spark and stuff like that. Um, I don't want to purely do research because people in industry don't care that you can do research. They appreciate it, but they want to know that you can apply it to a real world problem. And um, so I'm, I'm looking now, f uh, training myself for how to work in like an industry environment as opposed to the research environment. So I'm looking at what tools they use there. Because uh, one thing is a lot of uh, data sets that are used in industry are not very big. It might be just like a thousand or two thousand entries. Um, there's a site called KD Nuggets. It's like a data science blog, and they were talking about how a lot of people in applied situations aren't actually using huge data sets, um, and you can't use a neural network in that situation, right? So you kind of have to learn all the methods for classification. So I've, I've been working on that, and finishing this study still too. It's still going on. Is there any sort of repositories for data sets or anything? Because I mean, like, it sounds like that, uh, that Zillow competition is a great chance to get an actual data set. Oh, it's, oh, once you start looking, it's everywhere. There's everywhere. data sets. I think there's even a whole Reddit, subreddit for data sets. Um, but there's a lot of data sets even built. In, like the data set, this data set, the MNIST and the KIFAR 10 one are actually built into Keras and TensorFlow. They're so popular. You would just say like from data sets, import KIFAR 10 and you just have it. So, um, and the reason we use the popular ones is because, you know, classifying a data set no one's heard of before is kind of useless. You want to, I, I found that I like data science more than computer science because it's a sport, it's a competition. Software engineering is kind of an art. Data science, you're trying to constantly beat someone else's high score. How accurate can you classify this? And it's always a battle, and I think it's, it's really fun. There's leaderboards, you know, you don't get that in other uh, facets of computer science. It's pretty cool. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Appreciate it.